What's up, my wizards? Dev from SBMTG, and it's my turn to do a deck tech, and that's really cool. Um, for Proxy Wars, episode one, I've built a teamer mid-range with uh, all these new cool DTK cards. So, yeah, let's get with that. First of all, the deck runs 26 creatures. I had to make sure it wasn't 28. The deck runs 26 creatures, uh, starting with some mana ramp guys. You play two copies of Elvish Mystic because you need your one drop uh, ramp. You play three Sylvan Carry Edits and three Rattleclaw Mystics. Um, this was sort of a, a testing decision. You know, at first it was, you know, four Sylvan Carry Edits, but I want to test and see if Rattleclaw Mystic is better with some of these newer cards. Um, aside from that, that's all of our ramp. That's sort of our ramp suit. Um, you know, eight creatures for ramp right there. Um, moving on, uh, the last card in the two slot for the deck is one copy of Den Protector. Uh, I just wanted, again, to see how this guy plays in early testing, and he has done relatively well. He's really good value. Um, so, yeah, and you always trade him for something that you really want in your graveyard. I'll say that much. Like, you don't, you know, his, oh, one more thing about Den Protector. His ability, you know, can't be blocked by a creature's power less than him is actually incredibly relevant against a lot of the aggro decks and the Sylvan Caryatids of the format. So, I will say Dim Protector is a little better than I originally anticipated, and I would probably play more copies of him, although the Silver Bullet copy has served me very well. Moving into the three slot, we've got three copies of Savage Knuckleblade, which does an awful lot of work for you. Obviously, this is Teamer Midrange, Teamer Zoo, so you want to play this card. There are other reasons why we might want to play this card, but all the traditional reasons why you play Savage Knuckleblade, you'll play Savage Knuckleblade. I don't really have to explain too much why he's in a Teamer Midrange deck. Um, into the four slot is uh, Pelucrina, or excuse me, one more thing in the three slot, Courser of Crufix. It's almost like you don't even have to say Courser of Crufix. That's probably why I came so close to skipping him just now. Courser, same reason as Knuckleblade. You play him for all the same reasons that you always played him. We've played him for two and a half years now, almost two years. And uh, yeah, Courser. He goes in Teamer. He goes in everything with green, I would say. So you play four copies of Courser. <laughs> Moving into the four slot, this is going to be slightly controversial. One copy and no more of Pelucranos World Eater. Um, this kind of, more copies of this got pushed out so I could test out other newer stuff. Um, obviously, you play more Pelucranos than that, usually two or even three. Um, and in this deck, I wanted to try other stuff out. So right now, just the one Pelucranos, but I can still find him pretty easily. Um, and he still does all the work. Um, so yeah, moving on. This is where we get into some of our really high dollar, high uh, converted mana cost stuff. So let's start with two copies of Segu Mahler. Obviously the hex proof is a big deal. And there are three, if I'm counting correctly, three morph creatures in this deck or creatures you can play face down. And uh, yeah, when they guess Rattleclaw Mystic and it's a Segu Mahler, that kind of ruins their entire day. Segu Mahler does a lot more work than I thought it was going to. I didn't give Segu Mahler that much credit when I built the deck, but I kept seeing it in lists, so I was like, I'm going to try this. And it's been around for a little while now, and we have seen it a good bit, but actually playing with the card now, it is as good as a lot of people say it is. Segu Mahler is very good. Um, moving up a slot into the seven slot, we've got um, a lot of stuff actually. Hornet Queen, three copies of Hornet Queen because you play Hornet Queen. This busts up a lot of decks in the format. Hurts Chess Guy, hurts um, Abzan, uh, really hurts Abzan, hurts Red White Tokens and Blue White Heroic. Hornet Queen, one of the heroes of the format, and if we're playing ramp, we're gonna play Hornet Queen. There's just kind of no way around that. And here's a new card. Uh, we've got two copies of Dragon Lord Atarka right here in front of us. Dragon Lord Atarka has been really good in this seven slot. You'll almost always bust up at least two of their guys, almost no matter what you're playing. That's kind of surprising. Or one of their planeswalkers, which is obviously very good. Um, Atarka, I've said before, is a good reanimation target. This deck just hard casts him and does that very well. You can play Atarka fourth turn a lot of the time. So I, yeah, I like Atarka a lot in this kind of build. I'm not sure if we'll really see much Atarka in standard. Um, there may even be better stuff for this build, but just testing it out, Atarka has done a lot of good things for me, and I support Atarka. And rounding out the creatures is um, one you probably could have called. This is Genesis Hydra. I'm only running two copies 
of the Hydra right now. Um, but I should probably bump that up, to be honest. Hydra is as good as it's always been. Um, first time you read Hydra, you're like, oh, this is a really good card, and it turns out it is. Um, this is mostly meant, honestly, to go get a lot of the Planeswalkers that are in the deck. There are 10 Planeswalkers in the deck, which we will cover very shortly. But Hydra, with 26 creatures and 16, or excuse me, yeah, 26 creatures and 10 walkers, Hydra will get you something you want literally every time, not to mention he's going to be a huge guy. Hydra keeps doing what he's always done. Moving on to the Planeswalkers, like I mentioned, we have 10 of these, and they all do really, really good stuff for you. One of them I wasn't sure about including at first, but she's been great. Um, so let's talk about Xenagos. Um, we have two Planeswalkers in our four slot for Planeswalkers, I'm going to call it, and uh, two copies of Xenagos to begin with. Yeah, his ultimate, especially in something like this, is just ridiculous. And his first ability helps you get the ramp that you need. You know, you get mana guys out, you can tap them, and plus one him, play all your huge guys. You don't even need Nick those for this deck to produce ridiculous amounts of mana, and Xenagos is part of that equation. So, um, yeah, Xenagos. I wouldn't take him out either. He's He's been very good in this deck, which I discounted him a little bit at first. I wasn't sure I hadn't played much with Xenagos, but he turned out to be exactly what I wanted. <laughs> Definitely. Um, this one, this next one, also a two of, was the one that I was very doubtful of and impressed me a lot. This is Kiora. Um, Kiora, her second ability is quite, quite good. Draw a card, play a land. Um, that play land is really, really good for your ramp, and we've got some very relevant lands to play, and it kind of helps get over the these come into play tapped bump a little bit. And her first ability is good too, don't discount that, because you're trying to sort of outplay aggro a bit, and being able to shut down their best guy um, every turn while giving this counters is more than good. More than good. Kiora is better than I imagined she'd be. I just kind of put her in there to see, and yes, turns out the answer is yes. Moving on, we got the first of our Sarkin copies. This one copy of Sarkin the Dragon Speaker, who I may actually uh, bail out of this deck. I'm not sure. Uh, Sarkin obviously does all the things. Um, he has come down a bit in relevance from when he first entered Standard, but he's obviously still an important card in Standard. Um, I have only actually stuck this guy a couple of times in playtesting, and he still does what he's famous for. You know, you get Dragon, he becomes a Dragon. He's fine. He's just fine in this deck. Um, I would probably keep that one copy, but he is one of the most flexible slots in the deck as it stands right now. But his uh, counterpart, Sarkin Unbroken, I might actually take out the, the Dragon Speaker and put in a fourth copy of Unbroken. He's that good. Uh, people say a lot of good and sort of bad things about this card, um, but I'm here to say this card is the real deal. This is probably the best card in Dragons of Tartir. Um, one of the cards I've, you know, I've only played with maybe four cards from the set, obviously. But this card is the ish, you guys. Um, I'm, I'm here to sign on. I will co-sign for Sarkin Unbroken. Um, the First of all, let me run through this real quick because he's, he's really new and so I want to sort of showcase him. He's the reason I built the deck. Um, that draw a card and get an extra mana, I have never not used that extra mana. It's always incredibly relevant. The deck is very mana hungry for on-board effects, not just casting cost. So that extra mana is a big deal. Being able to protect himself by making a dragon, always important, um, which is probably one of the more used modes on the card. And then... Obviously, go get your Atarkas and put them into play, or your one Atarka. is the least used ability on the card, bar none, in this case. This, will, this ability will probably see more play as we go on, but just those first two abilities are enough to sustain you and, and win you a game, honestly. I really, really like Sarkin Unbroken, and he will continue to be in this deck, definitely. Um, and to round out the Planeswalkers, since we're a ramp deck, we're playing Ugin, the Spirit Dragon. Why wouldn't we? We produce eight mana fairly quickly. So we're playing Ugin, and yeah, I haven't stuck him too often, but when I do, he wins the game because he's Ugin, the Spirit Dragon. Um, against aggro, I've, you might want to board this out. I don't know how quickly you're actually getting to eight. It's weird. Seven is easy. Eight is a little bit more of a problem in the early stages of the game. But you still want to play Ugin, especially in a lot of the matchups that we see nowadays. You know, you go up against Abzan, I'd probably play Ugin. So, all things considered, Ugin's still a very strong Planeswalker in this deck, but showcasing Sarkin Unbroken, honestly. He's fantastic in this sort of mid-range build. And we originally envisioned a four-color control with Sarkin Unbroken, which is a thing I still think we want to do. But he's good in this teamer build, definitely. 
Uh, we have one spell in this deck, and that spell will be one copy of Collected Company, just because, again, I just wanted to play with this card. And this deck probably deserves more copies of Collected Company. It's done a lot for me. Not only can this get two of your ramp guys off the top at the end of your turn, so then you untap on your turn with all the mana, it can also get a bunch of Savage Knuckle Blades, Corsor of, Cruf Corsor of Crufix, it can get your Den Protector, you know, um, which is kind of not synergistic. That's an issue there because you can't play him face down with Collected Company. But just getting, I've got two knuckle blades off this before getting a double courser crucifix or a cruiser uh, a courser crucifix and a knuckle blade all these are very good uh we've talked about this card might have modern applications and it definitely does a lot more work in this deck than i again than i originally gave it credit for i played it just because i was curious and it did all the things that i wanted it to do so try out collected company for yourself i think this card might actually be the real dish you guys try it out i like it a lot in this thing well, you can't have a three-color deck without land, so I'm going to run over these super quickly. I am not a master of mana bases, but this works out very fine for what I want it to do. It's very heavy on green, slightly lighter on red, and very light on blue. Of course, you want to play your Sarkin, don't get me wrong, but you've got Sylvan Caryatid, Rattleclaw Mystic for that, and you've got enough blue sources in the mana base to where it will work out for you. You really only need the one blue mana most games. So... The basic uh, mana base, we've got four Frontier Bivouac, the Tri-Land. We've got four Mana Confluence, because you need that. We've got two Yavimaya Coast and two Shivan Reef. I might make that um, actually three and one, respectively. Uh, we've got two Temple of Abandon and one Temple of Mystery. The Scry is actually really good in this mid-range deck. And uh, two Wooded Foothills to fetch out. And only two Nykthos and not the three. Um, that may bump up, we'll see. But right now, I don't actually need Nykthos to do these incredibly rampy things. If you notice, I'm not even playing Voyaging Seder. The deck just makes what it needs to make organically. So, and um, aside from that, our basic lands, three forest and one mountain to make sure that you've got... Um, all, it's really, you've got to have the green mana in this deck. You're supposed to play your mana guys, to play Hornet Queens. You've got to have your green mana. Um, lastly, let's talk about the sideboard, which right now is sort of a work in progress. We just cobbled it together. But this does have, it mostly protects you against aggro to make sure that you can fire off. Um, first of all, two copies of Harbinger of the Hunt. This is very definitely a test card. Uh, we are testing out Harbinger of the Hunt in this sideboard to see if it actually does the thing. Since we're playing ramp, we can maybe get three activations, four even off of this, and yeah, it may actually be really good against aggro, but we might just want to play anger of the gods or something instead. Um, three reclamation sage, because you do that in green sideboards, because it's important to kill enchantments. Maybe naturalize instead, we'll see. Um, one copy of Pelucranos is in the board. I move him in against um, aggro matchups and other mid-range decks. Um, you've got two copies of Arc Lightning. We see a lot of that in sideboards lately. That is, of course, against aggro. Um, we've also got two Storm Breath Dragons, which may, may should be in the main deck, but this goes in against Red White Tokens, Jeskai, Blue White Heroic, yada yada. Protection from white is super good. Um, three Rending Volleys, while we're talking about Blue White Heroic and Red White Tokens and all that stuff, Rending Volley, pretty good, I think. This is another one I put in because I want to test it. It's a new card. Um, one extra copy of Den Protector, because against um, slower decks and even in some cases control, you're going to definitely want Den Protector. I, I think that he's... I think Den Protector is actually really good, just so you know. Um, and that extra copy in the board can help you against certain things, getting a little value and getting added things back after they've countered it or removed your guys. So maybe against control, maybe against other mid-range builds. And finally, one copy of Haven of the Spirit Dragon. Originally, it was my intention to put Dromoka in the board against control and then have Haven of the Spirit Dragon maybe in the main deck. I'm putting Haven of the Spirit Dragon in the main deck here to help you cast your Atarkas against um, more control-oriented builds or maybe even, maybe, aggro builds. That way you can get out slightly um, easier. But I don't know about the aggro builds. Definitely control, though. Definitely control. <laughs> So that wraps it up uh, for Teamer Midrange. Let us know what you guys think. I know there are some slightly controversial card choices. Forgive me, I'm trying to play with newer cards to see if they're in any way relevant. So, you know, give me and Tony, for that matter, a little bit of a pass on that because we want to see what's good and what isn't. That's the whole point of this. So, yeah, let us know what you feel about Mono Blue Devotion and about Teamer Midrange in the comments of those two videos or, you know, whatever. And we'll get started with Proxy Wars 
tomorrow. And you'll get to see how these two decks play against each other. Remember to leave ideas for more decks in the comments section, and we'll get to those as soon as we can uh, before the pre-release, um, before game day especially. That way you'll know how these cards interact with other cards in the metagame. I'm Devin from SBMTG. Remember, leave comments in the thing down there where there is a thing for you to leave comments. Share, like, and of course, subscribe if you like this content because all of our other content is also quite good and fun and awesome. So, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, guys. Proxy Wars coming up.